Chapter 13 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 13 A Break for Liberty. Zodar listened in incredulous astonishment to my narration of the events which had transpired within the arena at the rites of Issus. He could scarce conceive, even though he had already professed his doubt as to the deity of Issus, that one could threaten her with a sword in hand and not be blasted into a thousand fragments by the mere fury of her divine wrath. "'It is the final proof,' he said at last. No more is needed to completely shatter the last remnant of my superstitious belief in the divinity of Issus. She is only a wicked old woman, wielding a mighty power for evil through machinations that have kept her own people and all Barsoom in religious ignorance for ages. She is still all-powerful here, however, I replied, so it behooves us to leave at the first moment that appears at all propitious. I hope that you may find a propitious moment," he said with a laugh, for it is certain that in all my life I have never seen one in which a prisoner of the first-born might escape. "'Tonight will do as well as any,' I replied. "'It will soon be night,' said Zodar. "'How may I aid in the adventure?' "'Can you swim?' I asked him. "'No slimy Scyllian that haunts the depths of Chorus is more at home in the water than is Zodar,' he replied. Good. The red one in all probability cannot swim, I said, since there is scarce enough water in all their domains to float the tiniest craft. One of us, therefore, will have to support him through the sea to the craft we select. I had hoped that we might make the entire distance below the surface, but I fear that the red youth could not thus perform the trip. Even the bravest of the brave among them are terrorized at the mere thought of deep water, for it has been ages since their forebears saw a lake, a river, or a sea. "'The Red One is to accompany us?' asked Zodar. "'Yes.' "'It is well. Three swords are better than two, especially when the third is as mighty as this fellow's. I have seen him battle in the arena at the rites of Issus many times. Never, until I saw you fight, had I seen one who seemed unconquerable even in the face of great odds.' One might think you two master and pupil, or father and son. Come to recall his face there is a resemblance between you. It is very marked when you fight. There is the same grim smile, the same maddening contempt for your adversary apparent in every movement of your bodies and in every changing expression of your faces. Be that as it may, Zodar, he is a great fighter. I think that we will make a trio difficult to overcome." and if my friend Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, were but one of us, we could fight our way from one end of Barsoom to the other, even though the whole world were pitted against us. "'It will be,' said Zodar, "'when they find from whence you have come. That is but one of the superstitions which Issus has foisted upon a credulous humanity. She walks through the holy therns who are as ignorant of her real self as are the Barsoomians of the outer world.' Her decrees are born to the therns, written in blood upon a strange parchment. The poor deluded fools think that they are receiving the revelations of a goddess through some supernatural agency, since they find these messages upon their guarded altars to which none could have access without detection. I myself have borne these messages for Issus for many years. There is a long tunnel from the temple of Issus to the principal temple of Matai Sheng. It was dug ages ago by the slaves of the firstborn in such utter secrecy that no thern ever guessed its existence. The therns, for their part, have temples dotted about the entire civilized world. Here priests whom the people never see communicate the doctrine of the mysterious river Is, the valley door, the lost sea of Chorus, to persuade the poor deluded creatures to take the voluntary pilgrimage that swells the wealth of the holy therns and adds to the numbers of their slaves. Thus the therns are used as the principal means for collecting the wealth and labor that the firstborn wrest from them as they need it. Occasionally the firstborn themselves make raids upon the outer world. It is then that they capture many females of the royal houses of the red men, and take the newest in battleships and trained artisans who build them. 
that they may copy what they cannot create. We are a non-productive race, priding ourselves upon our non-productiveness. It is criminal for a firstborn to labor or invent. That is the work of the lower orders, who live merely that the firstborn may enjoy long lives of luxury and idleness. With us, fighting is all that counts. Were it not for that, there would be more of the firstborn than all the creatures of Barsoom could support, for in so far as I know, none of us ever dies a natural death. Our females would live forever, but for the fact that we tire of them and remove them to make place for others. Issus alone of all is protected against death. She has lived for countless ages. Would not the other Barsoomians live forever but for the doctrine of the voluntary pilgrimage which drags them to the bosom of Is, at or before their thousandth year? I asked him. I feel now that there is no doubt but that they are precisely the same species of creature as the firstborn and I hope that I shall live to fight for them in atonement of the sins I have committed against them through the ignorance born of generations of false teaching. As he ceased speaking, a weird call rang out across the waters of Omin. I had heard it at the same time the previous evening and knew that it marked the ending of the day, when the men of Omin spread their silks upon the deck of battleship and cruiser and fall into the dreamless sleep of Mars. Our guard entered to inspect us for the last time before the new day broke upon the world above. His duty was soon performed, and the heavy door of our prison closed behind him. We were alone for the night. I gave him time to return to his quarters, as Zodar said he probably would do. Then I sprang to the grated window and surveyed the nearby waters. At a little distance from the island, a quarter of a mile perhaps, lay a monster battleship while between her and the shore were a number of smaller cruisers and one-man scouts. Upon the battleship alone was there a watch. I could see him plainly in the upper works of the ship, and as I watched I saw him spread his sleeping silks upon the tiny platform in which he was stationed. Soon he threw himself at full length upon his couch. The discipline on Omin was lax indeed, but it is not to be wondered at since no enemy guessed the existence upon Barsoom of such a fleet, or even of the first-born, or the Sea of Omin. Why, indeed, should they maintain a watch? Presently I dropped to the floor again and talked with Zodar, describing the various craft I had seen. "'There is one there,' he said, "'my personal property, built to carry five men, that is the swiftest of the swift. If we can board her, we can at least make a memorable run for liberty. And then he went on to describe to me the equipment of the boat, her engines, and all that went to make her the flyer that she was. In his explanation, I recognized a trick of gearing that Cantos Can had taught me that time we sailed under false names in the navy of Zodanga beneath Sab Than the prince. And I knew then that the firstborn had stolen it from the ships of Helium, for only they are thus geared and I knew, too, that Zodar spoke the truth, when he lauded the speed of his little craft, for nothing that cleaves the thin air of Mars can approximate the speed of the ships of Helium. We decided to wait for an hour at least until all the stragglers had sought their silks. In the meantime I was to fetch the red youth to our cell, so that we could be in readiness to make our rash break for freedom together. I sprang to the top of our partition wall and pulled myself up onto it. There I found a flat surface about a foot in width, and along this I walked until I came to the cell in which I saw the boy sitting upon his bench. He had been leaning back against the wall looking up at the glowing dome above Omin, and when he spied me balancing upon the partition wall above him, his eyes opened wide in astonishment. Then a wide grin of appreciative understanding spread across his countenance. As I stooped to drop to the floor beside him, he motioned me to wait, and coming close below me, whispered, "'Catch my hand. I can almost leap to the top of that wall myself. I have tried it many times, and each day I come a little closer. Some day I should have been able to make it.' I lay upon my belly across the wall and reached my hand far down toward him. 
With a little run from the center of the cell, he sprang up until I grasped his outstretched hand, and thus I pulled him to the wall's top beside me. "'You are the first jumper I ever saw among the red men of Barsoom,' I said. He smiled. "'It is not strange. I will tell you why when we have more time.' Together we returned to the cell in which Zodar sat, descending to talk with him until the hour had passed. There we made our plans for the immediate future, binding ourselves by a solemn oath to fight to the death for one another against whatsoever enemy should confront us, for we knew that even should we succeed in escaping the firstborn, we might still have a whole world against us. The power of religious superstition is mighty. It was agreed that I should navigate the craft after we had reached her and that if we made the outer world in safety we should attempt to reach Helium without a stop. "'Why Helium?' asked the red youth. "'I am a prince of Helium,' I replied. He gave me a peculiar look, but said nothing further on the subject. I wondered at the time what the significance of his expression might be, but in the press of other matters it soon left my mind, nor did I have occasion to think of it again until later. Come. I said at length, now is as good a time as any. Let us go. Another moment found me at the top of the partition wall again with the boy beside me. Unbuckling my harness, I snapped it together with a single long strap, which I lowered to the waiting Zodar below. He grasped the end and was soon sitting beside us. How simple! he laughed. The balance should be even simpler, I replied. Then I raised myself to the top of the outer wall of the prison, just so that I could peer over and locate the passing sentry. For a matter of five minutes I waited, and then he came in sight on his slow and snail-like beat about the structure. I watched him until he had made the turn at the end of the building, which carried him out of sight of the side of the prison that was to witness our dash for freedom. The moment his form disappeared, I grasped Zodar and drew him to the top of the wall. Placing one end of my harness strap in his hands, I lowered him quickly to the ground below. Then the boy grasped the strap and slid down to Zodar's side. In accordance with our arrangement, they did not wait for me, but walked slowly toward the water, a matter of a hundred yards, directly past the guardhouse filled with sleeping soldiers. They had taken scarce a dozen steps, when I too dropped to the ground and followed them leisurely toward the shore. As I passed the guardhouse, the thought of all the good blades lying there gave me pause, for if ever men were to have need of swords, it was my companions and I on the perilous trip upon which we were about to embark. I glanced toward Zodar and the youth, and saw that they had slipped over the edge of the dock into the water. In accordance with our plan, they were to remain there clinging to the metal rings which studded the concrete-like substance of the dock at the water's level with only their mouths and noses above the surface of the sea until I should join them. The lure of the swords within the guardhouse was strong upon me, and I hesitated a moment, half inclined to risk the attempt to take the few we needed. That he who hesitates is lost proved itself a true aphorism in this instance, for another moment saw me creeping stealthily toward the door of the guardhouse. Gently I pressed it open a crack enough to discover a dozen blacks stretched upon their silks in profound slumber. At the far side of the room a rack held the swords and firearms of the men. Warily I pushed the door a trifle wider to admit my body. A hinge gave out a resentful groan. One of the men stirred, and my heart stood still. I cursed myself for a fool to have thus jeopardized our chances for escape but there was nothing for it now but to see the adventure through. With a spring as swift and as noiseless as a tiger's, I lit beside the guardsman who had moved. My hands hovered about his throat, awaiting the moment that his eyes should open. For what seemed an eternity to my overwrought nerves, I remained poised thus. Then the fellow turned again upon his side, and resumed the even respiration of deep slumber. Carefully I picked my way between and over the soldiers, until they had gained the rack at the far side of the room. 
Here I turned to survey the sleeping men. All were quiet. Their regular breathing rose and fell in a soothing rhythm that seemed to me the sweetest music I had ever heard. Gingerly I drew a long sword from the rack. The scraping of the scabbard against its holder as I withdrew it sounded like the filing of cast iron with a great rasp, and I looked to see the room immediately filled with alarmed and attacking guardsmen. But none stirred. The second sword I withdrew noiselessly, but the third clanked in its scabbard with a frightful din. I knew that it must awaken some of the men at least, and was on the point of forestalling their attack by a rapid charge for the doorway, when again, to my intense surprise, not a black moved. Either they were wondrous heavy sleepers, or else the noises that I made were really much less than they seemed to me. I was about to leave the rack when my attention was attracted by the revolvers. I knew that I could not carry more than one away with me, for I was already too heavily laden to move quietly with any degree of safety or speed. As I took one of them from its pin, my eye fell for the first time on an open window beside the rack. Ah, here was a splendid means of escape, for it let directly upon the dock, not twenty feet from the water's edge. And as I congratulated myself, I heard the door opposite me open, and there, looking me full in the face, stood the officer of the guard. He evidently took in the situation at a glance and appreciated the gravity of it as quickly as I, for our revolvers came up simultaneously, and the sounds of the two reports were as one as we touched the buttons on the grips that exploded the cartridges. I felt the wind of his bullet as it whizzed past my ear, and at the same instant I saw him crumple to the ground. Where I hit him I do not know, nor if I killed him for scarce had he started to collapse when I was through the window at my rear. In another second the waters of Omin closed above my head, and the three of us were making for the little flyer a hundred yards away. Zodar was burdened with the boy, and I with the three long swords. The revolver I had dropped, so that while we were both strong swimmers, it seemed to me that we moved at a snail's pace through the water. I was swimming entirely beneath the surface, but Zodar was compelled to rise often to let the youth breathe, so it was a wonder that we were not discovered long before we were. In fact, we reached the boat's side and were all aboard before the watch upon the battleship, aroused by the shots, detected us. Then an alarm gun bellowed from a ship's bow, its deep boom reverberating in deafening tones beneath the rocky dome of Omin. Instantly the sleeping thousands were awake the decks of a thousand monster craft teemed with fighting men, for an alarm on Omin was a thing of rare occurrence. We cast away before the sound of the first gun had died, and another second saw us rising swiftly from the surface of the sea. I lay at full length along the deck, with the levers and buttons of control before me. Zodar and the boy were stretched directly behind me, prone also, that we might offer as little resistance to the air as possible. "'Rise high,' whispered Zodar. "'They dare not fire their heavy guns toward the dome. The fragments of the shells would drop back among their own craft. If we are high enough, our keel-plates will protect us from rifle-fire.' I did as he bade. Below us we could see the men leaping into the water by hundreds, and striking out for the small cruisers and one-man flyers that lay moored about the big ships. The larger craft were getting under way, following us rapidly, but not rising from the water. "'A little to your right!' cried Zodar, for there are no points of compass upon Omin where every direction is due north. The pandemonium that had broken out below us was deafening. Rifles cracked, officers shouted orders, Men yelled directions to one another from the water and from the decks of myriad boats, while through all ran the purr of countless propellers cutting water and air. I had not dared pull my speed lever to the highest for fear of overrunning the mouth of the shaft that passed from Omin's dome to the world above, but even so we were hitting a clip that I doubt has ever been equaled on the windless sea. The smaller flyers were commencing to rise toward us, when Zodar shouted, the shaft! The shaft! Dead ahead! 
and I saw the opening, black and yawning in the glowing dome of this underworld. A ten-man cruiser was rising directly in front to cut off our escape. It was the only vessel that stood in our way, but at the rate that it was traveling it would come between us and the shaft in plenty of time to thwart our plans. It was rising at an angle of about forty-five degrees dead ahead of us, with the evident intention of combing us with grappling-hooks from above as it skimmed low over our deck. There was but one forlorn hope for us, and I took it. It was useless to try to pass over her, for that would have allowed her to force us against the rocky dome above, and we were already too near that as it was. To have attempted to dive below her would have put us entirely at her mercy, and precisely where she wanted us. On either side a hundred other menacing craft were hastening toward us. The alternative was filled with risk. In fact, it was all risk, with but a slender chance of success. As we neared the cruiser, I rose as though to pass above her, so that she would do just what she did do, rise at a steeper angle to force me still higher. Then, as we were almost upon her, I yelled to my companions to hold tight, and throwing the little vessel into her highest speed, I deflected her bows at the same instant, until we were running horizontally and at terrific velocity straight for the cruiser's keel. Her commander may have seen my intentions then, but it was too late. Almost at the instant of impact I turned my bows upward, and then, with a shattering jolt, we were in collision. What I had hoped for happened. The cruiser, already tilted at a perilous angle, was carried completely over backward by the impact of my smaller vessel. Her crew fell twisting and screaming through the air to the water far below, while the cruiser, her propeller still madly churning, dived swiftly head foremost after them to the bottom of the Sea of Omin. The collision crushed our steel bows, and notwithstanding every effort on our part came near to hurling us from the deck. As it was, we landed in a wildly clutching heap at the very extremity of the flyer, where Zodar and I succeeded in grasping the handrail. But the boy would have plunged overboard had I not fortunately grasped his ankle as he was already partially over. Unguided, our vessel careened wildly in its mad flight, rising ever nearer the rocks above. It took but an instant, however, for me to regain the levers, and with the roof barely fifty feet above I turned her nose once more into the horizontal plain and headed her again for the black mouth of the shaft. The collision had retarded our progress, and now a hundred swift scouts were close upon us. Zodar had told me that ascending the shaft by virtue of our repulsive rays alone would give our enemies their best chance to overtake us, since our propellers would be idle, and in rising we would be outclassed by many of our pursuers. The swifter craft are seldom equipped with large buoyancy tanks, since the added bulk of them tends to reduce a vessel's speed. As many boats were now quite close to us, it was inevitable that we would be quickly overhauled in the shaft, and captured or killed in short order. To me there always seems a way to gain the opposite side of an obstacle. If one cannot pass over it, or below it, or around it, why then there is but a single alternative left and that is to pass through it. I could not get around the fact that many of these other boats could rise faster than ours by the fact of their greater buoyancy, but I was none the less determined to reach the outer world far in advance of them or die a death of my own choosing in event of failure. Reverse! screamed Zodar behind me. For the love of your first ancestor, reverse! We are at the shaft! Hold tight! I screamed in reply, Grasp the boy and hold tight. We are going straight up the shaft. The words were scarce out of my mouth as we swept beneath the pitch-black opening. I threw the bow hard up, dragged the speed lever to its last notch, and clutching a stanchion with one hand and the steering wheel with the other, hung on like grim death and consigned my soul to its author. I heard a little exclamation of surprise from Zodar, followed by a grim laugh. 
the boy laughed too and said something which I could not catch for the whistling of the wind of our awful speed. I looked up above my head, hoping to catch the gleam of stars by which I could direct our course and hold the hurtling thing that bore us true to the center of the shaft. To have touched the side at the speed we were making would doubtless have resulted in instant death for us all. But not a star showed above, only utter and impenetrable darkness. Then I glanced below me, and there I saw a rapidly diminishing circle of light, the mouth of the opening above the phosphorescent radiance of Omin. By this I steered, endeavoring to keep the circle of light below me ever perfect. As best it was but a slender cord that held us from destruction, and I think that I steered that night more by intuition and blind faith than by skill or reason. We were not long in the shaft. Possibly the very fact of our enormous speed saved us, for evidently we started in the right direction, and so quickly we were out again that we had no time to alter our course. Omin lies perhaps two miles below the surface crust of Mars. Our speed must have approximated two hundred miles an hour, for Martian flyers are swift, so that at most we were in the shaft not over forty seconds. We must have been out of it for some seconds before I realized that we had accomplished the impossible. Black darkness enshrouded all about us. There were neither moons nor stars. Never before had I seen such a thing upon Mars, and for the moment I was nonplussed. Then the explanation came to me. It was summer at the South Pole. The ice cap was melting, and those meteoric phenomena, clouds, unknown upon the greater part of Barsoom, were shutting out the light of heaven from this portion of the planet. Fortune indeed it was for us, nor did it take me long to grasp the opportunity for escape which this happy condition offered us. Keeping the boat's nose at a stiff angle, I raced her for the impenetrable curtain which nature had hung above this dying world to shut us out from the sight of our pursuing enemies. We plunged through the cold camp fog without diminishing our speed, and in a moment emerged into the glorious light of the two moons and the million stars. I dropped into a horizontal course and headed due north. Our enemies were a good half-hour behind us, with no conception of our direction. We had performed the miraculous, and come through a thousand dangers unscathed. We had escaped from the land of the firstborn. No other prisoners in all the ages of Barsoom had done this thing, and now, as I looked back upon it, it did not seem to have been so difficult after all. I said as much to Zodar over my shoulder. "'It is very wonderful, nevertheless,' he replied. "'No one else could have accomplished it but John Carter.' At the sound of that name the boy jumped to his feet. "'John Carter!' he cried. "'John Carter!' Why, man, John Carter, Prince of Helium, has been dead for years. I am his son. End of chapter 13